I'm very happy to uh, introduce all the way from Australia, uh, Bruce uh, Horsfield. It may come uh, as a surprise to many people in this room to know that um, Australia has been perhaps the US's closest ally, uh, certainly a close and fervent military ally. Uh, just last week in Washington DC they celebrated 100 years of that alliance. Um, since World War I, Australia has, Australian servicemen and women have fought alongside Americans uh, in land, sea and air. And today you're going to get to meet one of those, uh, one of those guys, ex-servicemen, Bruce. Right now, for example, Australia has the second, only the second largest, is the only, is the second largest uh, vayar, or should I say, have men of, a servicemen with boots on the ground in Iraq. And the Royal Australian Air Force uh, has been bombing ISIS strategic uh, points uh, in both Iraq and lately uh, in Syria uh, on an ongoing basis. So uh, these guys are working together. Um, the 100 year anniversary, as I said, was celebrated last week in uh, Washington, D.C. But in 1951, they uh, signed the ANSYS Pact, which probably some of you people know about. It was a joint treaty between the U.S., uh, Australia, and New Zealand that they'd always be uh, allies together. The Australians have also coordinated uh, over the years very well with the U.S. Uh, in uh, humanitarian support uh, in times of disaster particularly in Asia and the Pacific, and uh, have served together in uh, supply and rescue of people in need. But today, uh, as I say, I'm going to introduce you to, uh, to Bruce. I met him last summer when I was in Australia. He got to tell me about um, a lifelong work he had done. He'd spent 18 years putting together a documentary on the Special Air Services, Australia's SAS. Uh, you met some of his co cohorts today, British SAS who was sitting over here. Thank you gentlemen for coming. What I said to Bruce, I said, why don't you come up uh, and talk about the SAS to old old pilots? And he said, crikey, are you crazy? You want me to come all the way to California to talk to a group of guys? I said, yeah, why not? So I finally was able to convince him that a couple of weeks in, uh, in the Coachella Valley is uh, preferable to two weeks in a hot and sticky Sydney summer. So. Uh, he being the entrepreneurial man, the practical fellow that he is, he promptly married his uh, sweetheart on uh, January the 17th and uh, turned this trip into a honeymoon. So I'm delighted that uh, Bruce is here with his pride. Just to stand up and take a bow there, did Come on, stand up and take a bow. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is uh, Jesse Horsfield, the new, uh, the new missus. Anyhow, uh, a little bit about Bruce's background. Bruce uh, is an educator and documentary filmmaker. Uh, he prides himself on a huge amount of time that he spends in painstakingly um, looking at and researching his military projects. He wanted me to tell you that uh, his TV series have been vetted by the Australian Special Operations Committee uh, for accuracy and for security. He's a, a man with a great eye for detail. Bruce was born in Sydney and educated at Sydney University, attaining further degrees in New England, and later his PhD at Exeter University in England. He joined the One Commando Regiment in 1958 and later took up recreational skydiving. He tells me he's made over 350 jumps from 30 different airplanes, everything from heavy transports to single engine airplanes. And in 1965, <clears throat> it's almost 50 years ago, he held the Australian freefall uh, parachute uh, jump being record, jumping from 31,000 feet. So he doesn't look like it, but he's a little wiry guy and <coughs> a proud little Aussie. Anyhow, uh, he, uh, he made a previous uh, documentary about the decisive battle by Australians against the Viet Cong. Uh, in southern Vietnam. Uh, the documentary is called The Battle for Long Tan. It received great acclaim both at home and abroad. If you want to see more of Bruce, he's going to be speaking on Sunday, this is the 31st, next Sunday, 31st of January at the Palm Springs Air Museum. He's going to show a little more of his documentary uh, and he's going to uh, be there to sign autographs and talk to you guys personally if you'd like to engage him. 
Uh, he's brought along a few copies of his newly completed uh, TV series for sale at the door today. At the conclusion, he'll, uh, he'll sell those at the door, or his wife will, or they will together. Um, they are beautifully packaged, a set of six DVDs for 85 bucks, which is considerably cheaper than what he sells them in Australia for. Uh, that's more than nine hours of viewing, so if you guys are interested, you could buy a set today, or you could go online and buy uh, one of his DVDs. So again, thank you everybody, and uh, it gives me great uh, pleasure now to welcome uh, Bruce Horsfield. Come on up here, mate. Testing, testing. Thanks very much for the introduction, Pat, and uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to be here. Um, listening to the introductions, I, I feel um, amongst uh, a very, in a very illustrious gathering. Uh, a lot of those aeroplanes that you guys have flown are, are stuff of legend, aren't they? So it's, it's great to be here, and Pat, thanks very much for making the whole thing possible. I've been enjoying. Um, Pat's, uh, we have been enjoying uh, Pat and Debbie's hospitality here in the valley, and uh, <laughs> what, a, what a wonderful experience has been so far. Well, look, um, without, any, uh, without any more ado, I'd like to slip into what will be uh, a talk with slides and a bit of video uh, anchored on the documentary series I've made, uh, The Australian SAS, The Untold History. And um, to kick it off, I'd just like to show you how each of the 11 episodes begins. So with the DVD, I'll just play you the, the title sequence and it'll give you a kind of introduction to where I'm at today. Uh, one minute of title sequence, which is to introduce the whole, some of the conceptual bases of Thanks. special forces. Uh, now, Phil, do you operate or do I? <coughs> Too smart. Special Forces, I kind of use interchangeably with Special Air Service and Special Air Service Regiment is that word regiment points to the Australian SAS. Many countries have something like that and we've got 21 SAS and 22 SAS from Britain represented today as you know. So Special Forces <coughs> is the idea of Special Forces troops. Anyway, here's the introduction. This is how each episode starts. <coughs> Got it here? Um, I was very fortunate to get a lot of uh, film from the Special Air Service Regiment in uh, Perth and elsewhere. <coughs> oh, I need a soundtrack with it, that's for sure. Sorry. Formed SAS from the ugly dumping of the Australian Army into private place as Australia's force of first choice. Okay, stop there, through it. 
just yeah. We take you on a <coughs> history of um, <coughs> the first thing uh, well, I just wanted to get into was this idea of a very basic distinction between special forces and conventional forces, um, and to that I'll uh, I'll go to um, the, uh, the the set of slides. Uh, well, I got this slide. Advancer or a beer pill? I have it. Continue just while that's coming up. I drew a distinction between special forces and conventional forces, and that's that's a classic distinction. Traditionally, um, all um, oh, great, thanks. okay, away we go. You can say a lot about each one, but uh, just to make some crude basic distinctions, the special forces do the jobs that regular units are not trained to do. Here's 173rd Airborne, um, which we regard as conventional, wouldn't be uh, on parade, and. Um, by contrast, it's a numerical thing, we've got the idea of small teams, and this happens to be Australian SAS uh, about to do a job in Afghanistan. You can see the, 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 few, the fewest of numbers. So on to theme two, what, what sort of things do Special Forces troops do? Well, it'll be not news to many of, of, of you. Um, what they do, but what we've got here is um, a, a picture of the British SAS, 22 SAS in um, uh, Iraq. So what do they do? <coughs> well, I then thought it would be very useful to go to Lawrence of Arabia as the archetypal uh, special forces or SAS type of soldier, because if, it's, if you bear in mind that he he, he had a, an interest in the Middle East as a scholar. He taught himself Arabic. He understood and acquainted himself with the culture, the geography, the history, the politics. And because he had all of that cultural and uh, knowledge and the, the language, he was able to become a very effective political uh, uh, and strategic advisor for British interests in the Middle East. Now. He was just one guy, so we're, we're talking about the enormous impact of, of fewness of numbers. And that's a, a kind of principle we're talking about with Special Forces today at SAS. It's self-explanatory. That's uh, Afghanistan. Um, we think, uh, you know, in this series, uh, one works pretty much against the media stereotypes of the special forces. We get these guys that are built, you know, like Tarzan and carry sexy weapons and do all sorts of UVA things. But where the SAS is concerned in Australia, um, that has not been the case at all, and I'll come back to that idea. Special forces can take ground, but generally not hold it for very long without conventional forces coming in. So they're not, not a, going to capture a lot of territory. And uh, especially in the case of the Australian SAS, they find only when they really have to, when they've been caught uh, or there's something going to fight their way out. But I have to say this, that uh, although they avoid, avoid a fight, um, when they do fight, they're absolutely ferocious. It's, it's really, really, uh, you come against a small SAS team, they're usually heavily armed, uh, heavy weapons, lots of it, and they are accurate. They seem to be very accurate when they aim, aim a weapon. That's, a, that's been common throughout my research. And uh, in Australia, the number one thing is strategic reconnaissance. 
Strategic's the key word there because strategic means you can affect policy at the highest level with your intelligence, you can change the whole structure and uh, meaning of the battle space, and uh, it's a big time word. I've also wanted to put this in, this was a demonstration uh, in East Timor in uh, 1999 or thereabouts when there was that trouble separating from Indonesia. And uh, it, this is the kind of territory, that, the kind of environment that SAS is trained to operate in with people. And so here we've got what sort of jobs do they do? Well, here are the American Green Berets training the Montreal Yard tribesmen in Vietnam in 1964. Uh, of course, counter-terrorism and counter-hijacking. Uh, hostage rescue, the, the most electrifying one of all, I guess, uh, for my ears, the uh, 1980 lifting of the Iranian siege by British 22 SAS, which is the, the stuff of legend. Um, <coughs> Australians uh, that work out to sea. Uh, here we've got um, close personal protection. Now, you can see an Australian SAS guy here, and, 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 and he's here somewhere on that the wrong angle. So just in here somewhere there's another guy like him. And um, they're protecting who is the guy who is now our Governor General, Peter Cosgrove. Now Hearts and Minds figures very largely this um, oops. this toy aeroplane, the kids are in trance, and so on. This isn't just PR, this isn't just keeping the locals happy. Hearts and Minds is a, a major special forces uh, tool. And uh, in, the, in the most special forces thinking from what I gather, that's more important than, than fighting. If you can get the people on your side, so we'll come back to that uh, once or twice as well. Again, um, this is the kind of environment that the special forces need to be comfortable with and make sure they are. And here are women on their way to market. Next theme is insertion, getting your special forces group into the area they need to operate. So you can drop them off, they can walk in, as you can see here, looks like quite a walk. Looks a bit to me like Palm Valley, actually. <laughs> um, Australians in their famous six wheel Land Rovers, <coughs> penetrating, going in by a canoe from out at sea. This was, uh, I love this photograph because it's one of the courses I did in one commander. Uh, using a British submarine and the same kayaks, the clever German canoes launched from the torpedo loading hatch and, and then paddling there. Yeah. So there's that, the insertion, of course, high altitude, low opening, and high altitude, high opening, where your parachute is virtually a glider, you can go a long way. Insertion by helicopter. That's now, we, other countries have special forces, just slip this in. Uh, it's not just that the, right, the major Western powers have SAS and special forces. So I just went through Google and made a selection and interesting to come up with India. Of course, we've got the US Navy SEALs, uh, Delta Force, the Green Berets, US Army Rangers, and the Australian SAS Regiment in Afghanistan. This, I like this picture for my purposes in the presentation because it goes in the direction of low technology and Australian SAS likes to work across the whole high technology, low technology spectrum. So it's not entirely dependent at any one point on either uh, source. And of course, 
the Australian Commando Regiment, my old people. Uh, I didn't know the Irish had commandos, here they are in East Timor. The Dutch uh, Special Forces in Afghanistan, French Commando Marine, Peruvian Special Forces, terrifying lot, and um, Russian Spessnets, of course, much feared in the, by the NATO people for a stay behind. This is really quite something, isn't it? Here's a guy doing a somersault. In the middle of the somersault, he's got to uh, throw his axe into this guy's head. Uh, you know, it reminds me of the great circus tradition of, of much of Eastern Europe, you know? Anyway, good fun. And of course, Indonesian Capacis, Australia SAS uh, and Capacis uh, danced a very, very fine dance in in uh, East Timor in 1999, 2000. Now we come to selection. Now I've put a bit of time and effort into selection because unless you select the right people, you don't get the missions done well and also the, the corporate profile goes down the gurgler. So the point there is the selection for Special Forces is crucial, the mission success and then I've said that selection for Special Forces is really as old as warfare itself. Now some of you may know this story that I'm about to go through. From the Book of Judges in the Old Testament, do you know this one? Gideon called for volunteers to fight the huge Midianite and Amalekite army whose camels were too numerous to count. <laughs> A big force. And Gideon, of Gideon's um, people, 32,000 men stepped forward. Gideon said to the 32,000, uh, anyone who is afraid or timid, uh, you can go home. If you don't like to fight, you can just go home. And um, 22,000 went home. <laughs> 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 Gideon took the remaining 10,000 on a long route march and when they came to Harrod Spring, they stopped for a drink. Gideon had a good close look at them drinking. Now, what do you see here? These three guys drinking. Look at the way this guy is drinking. Which guy was selected? This guy. He's got his hand on his weapon, he's got his eyes open, and he's drinking. These guys couldn't give a rat's. All they want to do is drink. These were selected, these were sent home. Anyway, out of the, um, out of the original 32,000, he took 300. I found this fascinating. And, then he did a very SAS thing. He sneaked into the um, enemy camp and, was, and eavesdropped. And he found out that the, this huge enemy was very nervous about Gideon being in the area. And he took this knowledge back and he equipped his forces, his 300 special forces, with some really sophisticated weapons a torch, a clay pot, and a trumpet. He surrounded the enemy, and on the, and the torches were inside the pots to hide them, but on the order, they had to break the pots with an enormous clamor, crash, shout their lungs out, and blast their trumpets. The Midianites thought a huge army had surrounded them, and in panic started to attack each other in the darkness. And Gideon uh, put those, that huge army to flight, uh, captured both of their leaders and executed them. Now, that's, as you can see, an apocryphal special forces story, the idea of a few making a huge difference over many, numbers not counting very much. And I wanted to put that in place so that as we go through it, we'll keep that in mind. So, 
What about Australian selection? Um, this is, the, I'm not sure about selection for British or American Special Forces in detail, but <coughs> I concentrate on selection for Australian Special Forces, the SAS Regiment. So here we go. The idea of SAS selection in Australia is they really want to expose the core lifelong personality traits to see who you really are. And what do they mean by that? They need to see the default you, the person you are when you are not being watched. The SAS, the individual, has to pass in the SEALs, I so I believe. The team, the whole team has to pass. So they're cultural differences. But um, the idea is that they want to see who you really are. And to do that, they engage in a food deprivation, sleep deprivation, but again with, with tasks like one fellow is saying they're getting about two hours sleep a night. They just get into bed and drop into a deep sleep and they have to get up and have lessons in, have a, in, lessons in Japanese. Uh, and, and they're absolutely tired out. So um, the other thing that came up often was that uh, they withhold psychological crutches such as instructor feedback a course finishing day, anything that you could hang your hopes on just to survive the selection course. Um, they call the, uh, and they had sickeners as well. A sickener was a, a cruel disappointment. You're told that at the end of this long route march, the trucks will be waiting to take you back. When you get there, you just see the trucks driving off. And even after weeks and weeks of, of grinding, exhaustion and hunger and so on. Even then, just as the course was about to finish, guys have chucked it in and said, this is absolutely stupid, I'm off. So it's a, you weed out the romantics, the guys who just want to wear the beret and get the real, the real colors. So what are the essays select selection criteria? For Australia, physical stamina endurance and endurance, they're telling, uh, pulling along the road uh, with their own load uh, of jeep. Mental stamina and endurance, that's a picture of a, an SAS team in Vietnam. <coughs> Social maturity and sociability, extremely important. Emotional intelligence, independence and self-reliance. Moral intelligence, <coughs> we've got one, two, three, four SAS guys with some Afghans here. And the idea is to establish rapport and real relationships. This is important too. The importance attached to divergent and natural thinking and creative problem, problem solving is very high in the SASR. Why? Because we're always short of money and um, we don't have the uh, sophisticated equipment and often our ideas are the saver. We'll see this later on when we uh, get into a little bit of video and we'll see some of that creativity actually being worked. Now, candidates are expected to have a good share of the attributes we've just looked at, but there is one rigid criterion of selection that all candidates must pass. It doesn't matter whether you're Superman, Spider-Man, and Batman all combined, you can be the hot shot. But if you don't have this one trait, you will never get accepted by SAS. Now, the illustrious gathering, what is that trait? Anyone? Loyalty. Loyalty is uh, a likely candidate, but it's not the one. <coughs> So anyone? True. Sorry? True. Yes, yes, but look at this. They're very serious about the sense of humor. Defined as a readiness to laugh at yourself for both your competencies and your incompetencies, not taking yourself or your situation too seriously. Humor lowers stress, reduces perspective, infuses interpersonal conflict, raises morality, refocuses the mission. This is serious uh, sense of humor. 
And they have had chewing exhaust or have damaged your RES, AS, they expect a smile. And I think I can see a few smiles there in that frigid Afghan winter. Now we talk about the how the Australian SAS uh, began. And there's that uh, generic um, batch of the SAS. Uh, some scholars say this is uh, the sword of Damocles, others it's, it's King Arthur's sword. Um, my research said it's Excalibur, King Arthur's sword with flames. Um, and that seems to be what the consensus is. <coughs> Now, we need to go back to World War I to a volunteer uh, battalion, infantry battalion, and that is the Artist Rifles. Uh, a volunteer sculptors, writers, musicians, and poets. Um, at a time when um, the volunteer units were, were, were much more common. Does anyone recognize this guy? Have you heard of Wilfred Owen? World War One poet. He was killed during World War One. The artist rifles volunteers. Now this picture I particularly wanted to look at because if we talk about a sense of humour as we did a moment ago, and look at these guys. <laughs> Sculptors, painters, artists. They're obviously in a pretty good mood, wouldn't you say? Um, the sense of humour seems to be playing through that. You know, this guy is an artist rifle soul. Do you recognise him? You heard of Sir Noel Coward? Yeah, that's him, young Sir Noel Coward. You know, this guy. He became very famous in World War II. I think the aeroplane gives it away. <coughs> guy in the bouncing bomb. Now, why have I got those pictures in? Because we're talking about earlier about creativity, diversity, about lateral thinking. And of course, this tradition permeating special forces is what I'm hammering away at. And the artist rifles going over the top. Now, artist rifles, to cut a long story <laughs> short, um, through various means, when special forces were re resurrected after World War II, the 21st SAS became based on the artist's rifles. And so that's why you've got this um, artist on their foot shoulder patch. Uh, it's quite odd. Australia then had its, also its own special forces tradition and they were the independent commando companies that operated to the north of Australia against the Japanese. Uh, here they are, um, independent, one of the independent companies on East Timor, on Timor during World War II. And I wanted this map to go in because of the, the vulnerability Australians often feel and while they're so, while they're so glad of the ANZUS pact, you get um, this idea of the yellow peril, which is a cliché term, the idea that Asia will pour down through the archipelago and take Australia and New Zealand. This map is an Australian map showing the uh, target, possible targets in Australia and the sort of aircraft from the north uh, that could, could do us down. That represents some of the Australian fear that goes on decade after decade. Now to go back to the 21st artists, 21st SAS, they were sent to the Korean War, but on their way, the Korean War ended, as I understand it, and so they went to Malaya for the communist terrorist emergency. And then from them, the SAS Malayan scouts were formed. And the 22 SAS that he uh, formed. And then from that, the Australia, after some lobbying, Australia brought in an SAS. Okay. Their first action was Borneo during the confrontation against Indonesia uh, with the naval patrols across the border. 
Um, deniable means you couldn't take dog tags, you had to bring your excrement back across the border. It was quite hush-hush at the time. Then Vietnam came straight away after that. And in Vietnam, the SAS really did come into its own. At the start of its commitment to, SA, uh, to Vietnam, no one knew how to use it. And that was a problem all the way along. What do you do with an SAS team? What do they, how do you train them? What do they do? This was the way things were. When they got to Vietnam, the, they wanted to shake them out and spread them out amongst the infantry, but they fought hard and they ended up going out on patrol into um, the, the Badlands. And this was the sort of enemy that they had, a very capable, very hardy, very well-equipped enemy. But they, although they regarded them as invincible, they made some mistakes. The Viet Cong, so I was told, um, would use the jungle tracks and the SAS would ambush them. And after a little while, they come back and you keep using the tracks and you get ambushed again. You know, they, they had that sort of vulnerability. But where the SAS really got to them, all guerrilla forces require a sanctuary, don't they? The Taliban have the Pakistani badlands. The Viet Cong had their deep jungle. What the SAS teams did in Vietnam, Australians did, was they penetrated the jungle sanctuaries and made them places of fear instead of places of rest and recreation and, and what have you. And um, they did it very successfully. I met many SAS veterans of Vietnam who actually told me about camping inside the Viet Cong camp. The Viet Cong jungle camp, and they'd go in and they'd be inside the camp. So we're often so close you could just reach out and tap the Viet Cong on the shoulder. I was trying to imagine this, it sounded absolutely incredible, but I've met so many guys with so many stories about that's what we did. Uh, they obviously knew how to camouflage themselves. There's that famous story of um, SAS by a track and the Viet Cong patrol come along and one of the Viet Cong relieves himself, uh, urinates on the Australian lying there, doesn't realise he's there. Uh, and the guy said afterwards, capitalist here and communist here and taste the same. <laughs> the, this sort of camouflage story. Anyway, I like this yarn too. They had this um, rifle, the uh, SLR, and be because they were so small, the uh, teams, they had to be very careful where they found themselves and so what they did here, a lot of them, is they cut off the barrel, a flash eliminator. They'd shorten the return spring, shorten that, file down the uh, change lever from to automatic, so that when you fired, instead of it being a repeating rifle, it could be a machine gun with a huge muzzle flash firing at a slower rate, but it sounded for all the world like a heavy weapon and not a rifle. And when they bumped into the Viet Cong, they let fly with these things, the Viet Cong would prop and think they'd run into a heavy weapons company. <coughs> and while they were propped, the SAS would tip it away and get away from the danger zone because they couldn't take on big forces. So this kind of trickery was quite common. Also, this psychological warfare going to the deep jungle sanctuaries or into their camps. The Viet Cong were very superstitious about the uh, ace of spades. Just pin it on the tree in the middle of their camp and kick it go away. Give them the heavy jeez. <laughs> or the, another trick they had, just to uh, find the Viet Cong camp and put a flare, time and time flare, it's set to go off at dawn. At dawn, what's happening? A fan is making its run, oops, on that flare, and 
before the Via Congar had been hit. This sort of thing was very much special forces tricks of the trade. You cannot mention the SAS in Vietnam without the 9th Squadron, Royal Australian Air Force. They flew the, uh, <coughs> the missions to insert and uh, exfiltrate. Uh, and so often they pull the SAS teams out of hot water, hot extractions where extractions under fire so many times that it's quite obvious that if the Air Force hadn't been working so closely with the SAS, SAS operations in Vietnam would have been curtailed very, very soon after they began. As soon as one or two people were killed, uh, that's what would have happened. And the stories of them using their rovers to, as a lawnmower to go down through the jungle canopy and pick these guys up, it's just an example of what was going on. Now, the other thing that's astonishing about Vietnam, just before we move on, is that after <coughs> six years of operating uh, so closely with the Viet Cong, the SAS did not, had not lost one man in enemy action. Not one man. They lost two that they accidentally killed of their own who'd gone out and come back into the patrol area from the wrong direction. Uh, one guy who fell off the rope during a hot extraction, but Thea Kong had a price on their heads, but it's never collected. So we move on to, just jumping forward now, there was a long piece for the Australian SAS after Vietnam. Uh, 30 years piece, and by that time I think everyone had forgotten it was an SAS. Then when 9-11 came along, um, Australia jumped straight in wanted to be part of it, try and do something about it. Now, asymmetric warfare, which is <coughs> this era now, it's, it's a heart and mind's battle for ideology, not for assets. It's not really a conventional war theme of asymmetric warfare. It's a different animal. And of course, 9-11 aroused ire against Osama bin Laden, and the idea was to get hold of this guy and uh, do something dangerous to him. <coughs> the Americans could not invade Afghanistan and catch this guy quickly. Their generals told, uh, the generals told Bushy it would take six months to mount uh, an invasion of Afghanistan. He said, I want something now, now. So the CIA said, well, we've got contacts in the Northern Alliance, the anti-Taliban forces. So they put in Green Berets, and whereas the US Air Force had been flying missions with nothing to bomb, they had no targets, once they put the Green Berets in with the Afghan warlords, they uh, cleaned up the Taliban in six weeks. <coughs> This guy comes into the picture, you recognise him at all? Mm -hmm. General James Mattis. When the Australian SAS was sent over there, he, um, he was the guy who got them into uh, the battle because until then there was no fight for them. But he knew about the Australian SAS and gave them a job, otherwise they wouldn't have been in it at all. The hunt for Bin Laden was pretty serious. Here we've got US Delta Force, the British Special Boat Squadron, British SAS uh, together uh, hunting for Bin Laden. I've given a whole episode to this Operation Anaconda. It took me years to get a definitive, reliable account of it because so many accounts varied. But basically, um, the CIA figured Oops, sorry. That Bin Laden was here in the Shirecott Valley in, Opera, in uh, Objective Remington in the Valley Floor. And they figured that if they made things hot for him, he would try to escape through these rat lines. So the idea was to put special forces ambushes in the rat lines 
frightened Bin Laden and his group in, and, and either kill him or capture him. And so the SAS all got involved in that, our Australian SAS and other special forces. But it was mainly seen as a conventional thing, 101st Airborne and the, and the 10th Mountain Division. The SAS wouldn't be in it. They said, no, we don't like, yes, your information's not reliable enough. All your information is from aerial surveillance. We're not joining you. So the Americans very shrewdly said to the uh, SAS, well, if, if you don't like our intelligence, why don't you go and have a look for yourself? And so they did. And they went in uh, on foot and they found a lot of stuff there and the Americans changed the plan, brought in the SAS, and the plan then was, oops, wrong button, the plan then was to land the 101st Earth on there, 10th Mountain there, have the SAS on the finger, that's the finger, as a cutoff party, the Afghan army would come down from the north, they'd go there and there, and you'd have this surrounded. It all went kablooey on the first day. Um, the CIA warned them that there were forces on the top here, but they still landed on the bottom and got the daylight shot out of them. Well, let's do a time check, Pat. Yeah, we're running tight on time now. Say again? We're running very tight on time. Okay. Well, I've given uh, episode 10 to that, but uh, what basically they're after a Bin Laden and his foreign recruiter, Jalabert and Hakani, 101st Airborne, 10th Mountain, the battle plan I've given you. This guy, Frank Grip, 10th Mountain, was a hero. While the bullets were flying, he just walked along, rounded his men, regardless of the bullets, ignored them, and, and he survived, etc. The Battle of Roberts Ridge, which some of you may have heard about. Now, this is where the action focuses. This is what took so long to get the story. This is an SAS team with an American JTAC, James O'Tarling. <coughs> they found themselves on uh, the finger. They found themselves just there. They could see the whole valley. And they started calling in airstrikes. And they saved the uh, rangers and, and seals on Takaga. And they started to bring the battle in on all of the fortified positions um, of the Taliban. Then they stayed there for about 12 days, bringing these people, um, the gunships and the ground attack. That story of Pedro Rustri, but it's, it's really a fantastic story of uh, battle. Okay, I'm going to rush this now. We're moving to the invasion of Iraq, and these are the British, American, and Australian special forces poised for the invasion of Iraq. They had important jobs to do, especially stopping the scuds from going into Israel, because if the Israelites were shelled, all hell would break loose, the Middle East would go up in flames. <coughs> the SAS captured the big uh, fighter base out in the desert, and uh, there was a joke that the SAS had more fighter aircraft than the Royal Australian Air Force. <coughs> The commandos backed them up by holding ground. And in the bit of video I want to show, they, uh, this lateral thinking thing comes up again with the use of an aeroplane to break the sound barrier to startling effect of people on the ground. And they go back to Afghanistan again in the late period. And we come to Islamic State terror, which is a period that hasn't as yet involved the SAS very much. And this idea of a caliphate. And I've quoted David Kilcullen here as an advisor. He thinks that 
ISIS really is a conventional warfare um, and are not a special forces thing because of the way they're fighting. Could I just finish now with uh, five minutes of DVD uh, from the series uh, just to show you the sort of thing that I've been rushing through. Sorry I took so long. Just from on from where we were is what we're doing. This is just a uh, compile um, of some of the things I've been talking about, uh, hearts and minds, and um, <coughs> yeah, we're often, Pat and I often agree that if the technology was going to let you down at any time, it would let you down when you most needed it. Yeah. <laughs> Sound about above the uh, the two cement silos. 
and came down in very low, very fast, straight over the cement factory, but didn't break the sound barrier. And they got on the radio and said, how was that? And said, that was excellent, mate. It was, it was fantastic, but uh, he didn't break the sound barrier. And he was, he was absolutely devastated. And he asked me again if he could have another go. I said, sure, have another go. And he come back around because it was a thunderous crack. <laughs> and it was done right over the top of the, the cement conning towers or the cement silos. We were able to disarm all the guards. During the battle, um, it became apparent that a lot of the B-52 strikes were wasted on probably missions that didn't need to be conducted. So we requested through the chaos that we get control of the B-52s, which we did, and had airstrikes conducted in an area where I thought the enemy would be affected to a, a greater extent. Our team leader, Matt, had incredible tactical cunning. Matt began to have an aha moment. He all of a sudden began to realize and shape the picture of the battle space through the enemy's eyes. He began to realize that if I was the enemy, this is where I would be reinforcing, this is where I would have my mortar positions, this is how I would run my supply lines. I was able to task the predator to look at those areas. And as the predator was moving around and looking at those areas, lo and behold, there was the enemy. The mortar positions were tents, they were trucks carrying ammunition, they were um, encampments of the enemy, and most of these were along creek beds. When the gunships check in at night, inevitably they would find something there, report back to us what they see, we would give them a, a clear off, which means that they could engage. We, we utilized the A-10s, there was two A-10s, and then as the Predator would find a new target, I'd roll the A-10 on that target, and the gunship would continue firing on that one. And then the Predator would find another target, and then I would move the C-130, the AC-130, to that target. We leapfrogged. Many nights we had four gunships, you know, back to back. One would turn up full, and the go home, and the Americans would call it Winchester. When they're Winchester, they'd run out of all ammunition, so they would check in full, go home, Winchester, four of them in a night. That happened for a lot of nights. That's it. Sorry, I ran out of time, but um, <laughs> and I'm very much indebted to the American system for that gunship, uh, the Spectre and A-10 stuff at the end, and the uh, Predator shots at night and so on. I have, uh, oh, that was marvelous stuff to get to tell such a story. Thank you very much for your attention.